It is time for Appraise This with Tim Luke and Greg Strom, the appraisal guys, the frick and frack of Nick and Knack. Uh, you can find them on the web at tqag.com uh, and right here on Robin Hood Radio. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I had, I thought I printed it out, and I didn't. So shame, shame, shame on me. Maybe I have it over here. Hang on a second here. Because uh, I actually uh, did, yes, there it is, son of a gun. Uh, and the first thing, because I know nothing about this, if Jill were around, she could talk about it, was uh, a painting by uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, it was sold at auction, I guess it was last week, uh, for um, $15.4 million. A drop in the bucket. Yes. Yeah, street, <laughs> street scene in... No, this is where Jill could do it. This I can't. Street scene in... I'll call it Montemari, but it's Montmartre, whatever anyways. It was painted in 1887. Right. Amazing. And the, the interesting thing with this is that the auction was, uh, it, sold, it sold last Thursday, and it was a live-streamed auction from Paris uh, is where that piece sold. Um, and I'm sure... Even you see it in the photograph. I mean, it's it's probably it's it, when you see it in the in in a picture, it looks like oh, this is a very big painting. But then when you get close up, it's not as big as you think. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a, most of his works. That that's how it was. Uh, the portrait of Doctor Gachet when I sold when I was at Christie's when that sold, and at that point it sold for eighty two point five million dollars and. Uh, but this is um, this is this is a it's pretty good price for this. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it was what they expected what eight uh, about nine million dollars or U.S. money wise right. for it, and it came in. You're right about the size of paintings. Like probably fifty percent of the world hasn't seen the Mona Lisa, and I think they're going to be disappointed when they do. <laughs> oh, I can tell you firsthand. I was. I stood when we uh, in 1979. I. I had the good fortune of sp spending uh, Christmas or the Christmas holidays in Paris. And one of the places we went, of course, was to see the Mona Lisa. And I stood in line and I, you know, you could, at that point in time, you could walk, you could literally walk up and touch it. That before all, all of the, you know, all of the stuff that's happened. Uh, and I, I was expecting this, some I don't know a, a religious experience for some reason, and I get there and I look at it, and it's like, oh my God, this is this is this is so underwhelming. <laughs> it's it, well, it's funny. It's and it's 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 plain size, really. I think people expect uh, the Mona Lisa and other <laughs> fine pieces of art to be the size of art that billboards. they yeah they, <laughs> billboards or, or or what they did in art class you know what i mean right. it is, and it's right. and it's it's not You're that right. way and You're so right. if you go in with those high expectations uh it, it it's it's kind of disappointing but really when you step back and think about it uh it's still it's still amazing when when something is that durable and i don't mean that the, the painting itself but i'm talking about um the painting and what and what it means to people something that durable yeah. it really is Correct. amazing yeah. yeah. Well, what's in, what's interesting with this piece is that the, it was in a private collection uh, for over a century, so it it really had not been uh, seen publicly seen uh, and viewed. And the other thing about this, which uh, you don't hear too much about, but at there was a bidding, there was a technology glitch. Like it's good to know that even it happens at the big auction house because this was at Sotheby's in Paris. And there was a bidding glitch, actually, that took place during the uh, the time that this was sold. And it, it says that the auction house experienced an unspecified glitch in its online bidding system that forced the vendors to redo the sale uh, at the end of the event. So what they had to do is they probably had to call everybody, make sure that they were back in and uh, get back in to uh, into the sale. So. You know all these little unforeseen things that go on. <laughs> well, especially well, you know if you look at the painting itself, it is it, to me it's rather unusual looking for a Van Gogh because yes, I think for the most part people when they hear the word Van Gogh they they think of um, when you stand back portraits. it looks it looks like a uh, 
you can still see the impressionism, uh, uh, the impression, the way it was painted, the impressionism of it. But if you look at this one with the, you know, the farmhouse, I, I, it's a little yeah. sp- more, much more specific in its content than, um, and th- th- than most of his other works. And I suppose if you, if you didn't know. Uh, and you saw a bunch of Van Gogh paintings on the wall with this mixed in it, you would say, oh, who painted that? No. Vincent no. Van Gogh. Now, you know what's interesting, Tim, getting to you about having to redo the auction, you know, when you have a bunch of millionaires bidding on something that's worth <laughs> the millions, and you know that millionaires can lawyer up, it's 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 one of those things where uh-huh. you, you, you fix it, immediately and you you do what you can immediately to make everybody happy most definitely most definitely and what they were they also uh reported is that there were uh, an extremely high number of phone bids on top of the online online bids uh from all over you know from around the world so it's it's a logistical um nightmare if you want to say that but it but it is a logistical feat to try and say especially at that level oh we're having difficulties let's 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 uh let's restart let's do this and we i've i've experienced that uh on a smaller level like with Bertoya, when there were the internet would go out and of course the people that were in the room they said no you have to keep going you have to sell it because we're here they're not that's not our bit that's not our fault and I mean, heckling me from the <laughs> stage, and I, I, I just, I just said back to them, and if it were your item, you would like us to wait, which is what we're going to do. So just be patient, <laughs> because if if you were the seller, you would want us to wait because you want to make sure that you can get everybody who wants to bid into bid, and also and that's what we do. That's what <laughs> that's what makes the credibility of these auction houses because yes. if they if they if if they lose one iota of credibility, yep, it's gone. It, it, that right. doesn't come back. It, no, know, exactly right. once you lose that, it's done. It doesn't matter it, whether, honestly, it doesn't really matter if it's a legitimate mistake yeah. or if it was intentional. At this, you know, at at that level, uh, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect your credibility and your your uh, ability to sell um, significantly. So. Uh, um, you know, especially now with online things, there's so much, much, so much more transparency because everything is live 24 seven. And there's so much that you can find out that um, it, it makes it it puts an extra level of stress, I think, uh, on the auction houses. You know, another thing I want to move away from paintings and this we talked a little bit about this, uh, about photographs and there's a there's a pretty big auction coming up uh, on photographs from uh from william henry fox talbot which is going to be which is going to be held uh and that goes that goes to my question once again um now of course photographs i don't think are going to pull what paintings pull uh but when you get major photographers and you have uh auctions like this i guess there's there's lots of money that's going to transpire Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and people don't think that photographs can command large amounts, but they can. They really can, depending on who the artist is. So, um, and you know, they're kind of fo- the the photograph uh, of the photographic auctions are somewhat under the radar for the for the general public because people just kind of don't think about photographs a lot of people as art so um it it is uh uh, but i personally i really like a photograph photographic auction because some of the the images are so amazing considering when they were taken and the technology that was used that that in itself is uh amazing well it'll be it'll be interesting to see how this goes the marshall because it is. It's it's almost two hundred images, and it's an early uh, look into nineteenth century Victorian uh, Britain and what was going on 
in that time. But the auction, Sotheby's is selling this, and they're selling it as one lot, as one collection. I was I was uh, going to ask these photographs. I was going to ask you about that. It's one lot. Yeah. All the photographs. Is that the way most of these uh, these photographic auctions go, where it's just one lot and you get uh, uh, X amount, let's say, uh, maybe four or five different collections in one thing? Is this the way it normally is done with photographs? It it mm. it depends because they can uh, they can break them up, but this is probably they want to keep it together because it individually. It may, and and it really it, it would depend on the the client, the way that they want to sell it, and also they're just thinking that this would sell better as a collective, as opposed to the sum of its parts. Now I've seen time. It, it'll be interesting to see what this what this ends up selling for, because this is a choice, and it's whenever. Yeah, when you look at other things, like uh, collectors have come to us and said, well, I want to sell it as one lot. And I always say, well, and, and again, depending on the asset class, but if it's a toy collection or some other group of, of other things, I always tell people, some, people like the thrill of putting a collection together, not just doing it in one fell swoop, unless they're thinking that they want to have this in a museum or that they want to market it as one collection because then... Um, somebody will do that to uh, put it out there and be donated as part of a collection, do something else. But it's interesting because the, the collection is estimated at three hundred dollars to $500,000 for that lot. And, um, and it's, uh, uh, it's an, it's an interesting choice. Is I would I, what I, would, I would say, I would think that's the only way you could, unlike the other auctions that, that, that you handle uh, and other auctioneers handle where there's different lots because there's significant individual items. I would think that uh, in, in, in photography, especially putting one's works together that cover uh, a multitude of different images is the only right. way you could really get the, the, the dollar value up there. Right. And I think that's what they're going for here, you know, for something like this. I still find it uh, uh, unusual, not odd, unusual that they're selling it as one collection because um, I, I, it, it's not something that's usually done because uh, a lot of people, unless you do, like Tim said, uh, you need to have the entire, keep the collection together. But it's it's kind of a gamble, I think, because it, it, it would it reach... It's will it reach its its uh, zenith, at, or will it just because it's sold as a collection and there are things in there that some people might not want? Will they bid less? So it'll be interesting to see because it's a that's a large grouping, and um, I, I I don't know. I think it will be interesting to follow to see how this works. Well, and it's what they've done, too, is that it looks like Sotheby's has put this together in with a group of other uh, uh, well-known photographers. And the sale is basically um, all of the pieces are a collection of images. So, uh, you know, whether it's whether it's five, 50, 10, 11, I'm just looking at they're they're doing uh, the there's a series the last resort and 11 images from the celebrated fashion photographer richard avedon so it it must be a part of what their whole thing is for the sale is that there's multiples of these and uh you know it'll be again interesting to see what this sells for what the whole thing ends up selling for now i i saw something uh two days ago and uh it's it was it's a streaming show. It's on one of I think it's probably on Discovery, but it was so stupid and crazy. I watched like three in a row, <laughs> and it's where people bring in auctioneers to their houses and they want to get rid of everything that's in the house, and then they they uh, they agree that uh, the opening price for every item is one dollar. And uh, they list everything, and then they have they have an online auction, and and I watched the first one, and I watched the second one, and I watched the third one, and the people doing the appraising at the houses, ninety nine point nine percent were way off, and they were they were way high. 
Yep. And they almost turned it into like a, a football game where during the auction where they, they follow the different prices that are going to close in like a minute or two minutes. Right. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but don't watch it. It's 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 aggravating. <laughs> it's it's aggravating yeah. because I think it, it's a show that traps people into thinking, hey, you know, I'll do that with my house because people come out with like twenty five, thirty thousand, maybe eighteen thousand dollars. But you know what? It still looked like a scam to me. Interesting. Well, this is one of the things that we have uh, talked about with clients in the past and said, oh, well, I, I saw this, uh, you know, I, I was bidding on this online auction and um, it looks like it sold for uh, $10,000, let's say. And it turns out that it, it could have only been uh, the company that was selling it online being in the room themselves and they were bidding against whoever was bidding against them, which is not, you know, which is unethical, but you have to know, this is where you have to really understand and know what the auction house history is and how they operate. Because over the years we have seen for comparables as appraisers, if we were looking for, uh, looking for the comparables on a statue, let's say a bronze statue, and we see this one particular auction house coming up with the same image over and over again, that tells us that that auction house is just fishing, trying to get somebody to bid on this so that they can drive the price up. And it, they say that it sells for, let's say, the minimum, which is $10,000. But actually, they could have been the people who actually put the $10,000 bid on it so that it wouldn't sell for less than that. And they are um, – that way they're guaranteed that it's it, – it's going to eventually sell because a week later you'll see it again in the same auction house, that same image, that same item up for auction with another another bid. So you have to know how in, to interpret the online data, and that's something that takes it, it takes time to understand. Well, that too, but also, and I think what you're saying, Marshall, is that. Uh, the people who are putting values on the stuff saying that this is what they think it's going to sell for, and, and you're saying that they are very high when they're saying this is what they think it should bring, is, I mean, uh, it sounds like what Cash in the Attic was. When I did yeah. Cash in the Attic is going in the houses and do this, and I will tell you that the producers on just about every shoot would say, you need to come in, you need to say that it's higher. Because we need to have drama. Because if it doesn't sell for so much, then we need to have. And I said, well, look, I, I can't do that. That's going to really compromise my credibility. And I said, you're going to have to find drama somewhere else. But this is what it is. And if I say anything that it's going to be you know, too much higher, then I will lose and lose my credibility in this entire marketplace that I've been, that I've been in. And it's just not. It's, it's not the way that it should be done. And the other appraiser that they used, uh, she would, she just said, oh, okay, you want me to say that it's this? Okay, you know, and just did it. And, and all of, she was always off. And it was just one of those things that when I went into a house in the second season, families were saying, oh, I'm so glad it's you because that other one seems to be very high. In her, in her appraisals, and we want a realistic view of what what we might get. Well, that's why I bring, and that's why I'm bringing the show up because I compared it to what 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 you used to do uh, with the cash yeah. in the attic, and it's a totally yeah. different thing. This show obviously is out there once again, and the only reason the show is on the air is to excite people to contact them more to do these to do these auctions. That it's it's just it it just is right. a, it is just a shameless self promotion machine. Yes, I know when you have a TV show, you've got to promote and get pe keep a, people interested. But I think Tim, if you like, you just said if 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 you you can keep people interested by just quoting the right prices and then still seeing yeah. the eventual outcome. Right. It, exactly. And we had to create drama 
or, well, I didn't create the drama. I said, that's your job. I said, you hired me as to give my professional opinion. And if you want somebody with credibility to give personal opinion, that, then that's what you've got. But if you want somebody to just say, oh, it's worth this, and, and then it, it doesn't sell for that, well, what good is that? And I said, you're doing a disservice not only to the individuals because you're duping them into thinking one thing and then there's another, and then also to the public. And this goes out to what Greg was saying is that, uh, you know, <laughs> you get that out there. And then whenever you show up, people are going to say, oh, well, I don't trust you <laughs> if you can't tell me uh, what these things are worth. We've seen this, uh, you know, time and time again. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm. And there have been a number of Don't appraisers like and auction houses who have done this, and they're they're not around anymore I'm, because the public the public will wise up eventually. I was going to say this all comes back to what we were talking about credibility. After I watched just three or four things, I would never ever think of putting on this show again because there is a, there's a credibility factor there and a non believability factor. Right. That's even worse right. than having a credibility where he's just not believable. Correct. And that was the, the thing that I was really adamant about. I said, well, if you want me a part of this, I want to make sure that, that first of all, things sell for, you know, we're going to say this is what they sold for, is that we're not going to just try to make something up. And the other thing with Cash in the Attic is that they didn't show every single yeah. item selling at auction. They showed highlights of things that were featured in the house and then and then how they actually did. But it was always, and this is what's typical about auctions and typical about collections, is that you can't just look at one item and say, oh, the, the sale did terrible because that one item didn't perform. When overall you made more money than you thought. You know, when we said, oh, you're gonna you're gonna walk away with ten thousand dollars and they walk away with fifteen, but then they say, oh, but that one item only sold for fifty dollars it wasn't a big success <laughs> and it's like you can't you can't just focus on that one that one thing you have to look at the whole and i think that's that's the uh the thing and that's the thing with the whole uh series in the way that that was set up is that they weren't looking at individual performances you have to look at uh what what the entire collection brings and not individually well, anyway, it was just one of those things yeah. that caught my eye. And Gets me worked up. If, if I if I if I can find out the name of the show, uh, I'll pass it along to you guys via email, and you can watch Please. it once and, and vomit. Is what you can do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, stay uh, stay warm and safe down there in Florida. Thanks. Have a great week. Thanks. Have Ta a great week. Take care, guys. Take care, Marshall. Bye. -bye. Tim Luke and Greg Strom, the appraisal guys, the frickin' frack of Nick and Knack, Treasure Quest Appraisal Group. You'll find them on the web, tqag.com, and you'll find them right here on Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com. Click on On Demand. Click on Appraise This with Tim Luke and Greg Strom.